early. Well, maybe let Emerson get to it. But ultimately, here's, here's the distinction he's going to make. You can have sympathy or simply say out loud, I don't like the evils of the world. But that is not good enough at all. That is going to be his argument. Help those who are actually in pain with real action and not just with some kind of altruistic talking or words. That at least is one reading of this. Another reading of this is just that Emerson is flat out wrong. Um, and of course, we had to fight a civil war to make sure to prove that Emerson here is flat out wrong. They, they love afar, or thy love afar is spite at home. In other words, he says, rough and graceless would be such greeting, but truth is handsomer than the affectation of love. In other words, there is real love and then there's faking love. I think maybe one of the arguments he's making is that people were getting caught up in the abolitionist movement as simply a movement, and they were giving lip service to the idea that slavery was wrong. And I think this upset probably Emerson. In other words, he says, I want real action. I want someone to stand up and have a real opinion for himself. Don't just tell me you're against slavery because that's what everybody else says. That's at least a charitable reading of these lines. As I said, guys, Seriously, this is a very controversial... You're, you're normally in a high school anthology, for example, not going to get the lines we just read. They're usually edited out, right? We'll keep reading, right? Rough and graceless would be such a greeting, but truth is handsomer than the affectation of love. Your goodness must have some edge to it, else it is none. The doctrine of hatred must be preached as the counteraction of the doctrine of love when, the pules, uh, when, that, when that pules and whines. I shun father and mother and wife and brother when my genius calls me. I would write on the lintels of the doorpost when. Well, this is obviously very, very controversial. He continues, There is a class of persons to whom by all spiritual affinity I am, brought, I am bought and sold. For them I go to prison if need be. But your miscellaneous popular charities, the education at college for, of fools, the building of meeting houses to the vain end to which many now stand, alms to sots, and the thousandfold relief societies, though I confess with shame I sometimes succumbed and gave the dollar, it is a wicked dollar, which by and by I shall have the manhood to withhold. Now this sounds, of course, very much like our reading of Ayn Rand's Fountainhead, and, of course, Atlas Shrugged, the, the critique of altruism. In other words, there's somehow a moral obligation to get involved in charitable acts when your heart is actually not in it at all. It's what you are expected to do, and so you do it. For, uh, 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 again, for, uh, for Emerson, this is a serious problem. Paragraph number eight, he says, My life is not an apology. He says, It is a life. It is for itself not for a spectacle. I wish to be, he says it, sound and sweet. Now, we think, of course, of Thoreau the minute we read lines like this. Paragraph number nine, we, um, we, we meet this one, uh, a famous, famous set of lines becoming even more controversial. How do you leave a, live a unique life? Here we go. Paragraph nine. What I must do is all that concerns me, not what the people think. This rule, equally arduous, in actual and in intellectual life may serve for the whole distinction between greatness and meanness. It is the harder because you will always find those who think they know what is your duty better than you know it. <laughs> Some of you will have to smile and think about the adults in your life who are always telling you what to do, right? It's easy in the world to live after the world's opinion. It's easy in solitude to live after our own. But the great man is he who in the midst of the crowd keeps with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. Wow, this is compelling stuff. Uh, I've, I've often said in my lectures on American thought that one single mantra, if I have to reduce all of American thought down to a single mantra, is don't tell me what to do. That notion is born heavily right here. Uh, in other words, the argument is, I don't need you telling me my duty, because then that makes me a follower of you. And even if you're right, I need to come to it in my own way and in my own time. It's a very interesting 3B question to ask, and even though we're not quite finished, let's begin to ask some of these questions. Has your education, your formal education, been an education that teaches you to make up your own mind, to find your own duty? That's an interesting question. Think about that one and maybe go for a walk later and kind of posit whether you think You've been challenged to come to your own duty, or, more particularly, have you been waiting for somebody to tell you what to do all of the time? What do great workers do? And employers will always say this about a good worker. What is it that 
he or she will say, well, when this student is working for me and runs out of something to do, she doesn't sit there waiting for me to tell what, you got it. She jumps up and goes and finds something to do. In other words, to be independent and not dependent, not reliant upon somebody else to tell you what your duty is. Of course, he says it. there's always somebody who's ready to tell you what's wrong with your life. And the minute you look at their life, you go, dude, what's, what's up with you? I mean, you've got all kinds of problems yourself. What are you telling me? Remember what we said earlier about Emerson. He genuinely believes this. You have to leave the world a more awakened place than you found it. However, that happens first by taking care of yourself, and then you can help others. Paragraph 10 begins with this one. The objection to conforming to uses that have become dead to you is that it scatters your force. We're back to this notion of power. It loses your time and blurs the impression of your character. If you maintain a dead church, contribute to a dead Bible society, vote with a great party either for the government or against it, spread your table like base housekeepers under all these screens, I have difficulty to detect the precise man you are. But do your thing, and I shall know you. Do your work, and you shall reinforce yourself. Wow. A man must consider what a blind man's bluff is this game of conformity. It's a powerful paragraph as well. Paragraph, uh, he talks about it. He says, he hates these political parties. He hates the foolish face of praise. In other words, to just get applause. I mean, there's a huge debate right now about this whole notion that should every kid get a, a participation certificate or a trophy or whatever. And any time you hear someone say, no, Everybody shouldn't get a participation trophy. Only winners should get a participation trophy. Very Emersonian idea. In other words, you got to do something that you feel proud of before you will ever really feel good about yourself. And somebody just giving you false praise or praise that's kind of empty, he's got serious problems with it. Paragraph 11, he says, nonconformity is hard. you got to get accustomed to society's sour face because you're going to do some things and say some things that people are not going to necessarily agree with. This is, of course, Emerson as his iconoclastic self. That's that first permeation that we said we have to see for Emerson. Now, don't get this wrong. Emerson was beloved of a large number of people, but he had the ability to really torque off people. Much like Socrates, we think of Emerson, who's this cat who can kind of buttonhole people and start asking them questions and make them very, very uncomfortable. Many have seen paragraphs 12, 13, and 14 as really, in many ways, the second heart of this of this essay. Let's just take a look at all three of those paragraphs. They're quite short. The other terror that scares us from self-trust is our consistency. In other words, keeping, keeping some kind of, uh, of rhythms consistent. A reverence for our past act or word because the eyes of others have no other data for computing our orbit than our past acts, and we are loath to disappoint them. In other words, we're always worried about what people think about us because we know that they remember our, that they remember our past actions, and then they might make judgments about us. But, paragraph number 13, but why should you keep your head over your shoulder? Why drag about this monstrous corpse of your memory lest you contradict somewhat? you have stated in this or that public place. Suppose you should contradict yourself. What then? It seems to be a rule of wisdom never to rely on your memory alone, scarcely even in acts of pure memory, but to bring the past for judgment into the thousand-eyed present and live ever in a new day. Trust your emotion. Now, let's just pause for a moment. This notion of trust your emotion is really controversial for all Platonists because you'll remember in Republic that Plato says... Socrates, of course, say it, that you have to have wisdom, reason, which will govern emotions and desire. That is the tripartite view of the human for Plato, and wisdom, reason has to be the one running the show. Remember the word picture of the chariot. But here, instead of reason being what's in control, emotion, trust your emotion. Now, how exactly is it that Emerson gets away with this? Again, it goes back to his Platonic understanding. If you are living focused on that metaphysical second box, your emotions will then be pure. They won't be driven by that sensuality of the first box. If you don't understand that distinction, Emerson kind of works off of the assumption that you will understand that distinction. If you don't understand that distinction, then a lot of this is just too controversial to accept. Trust your emotion. In your metaphysics, 
you have denied personality to the deity. And that is to say, for, uh, for Emerson, the idea is simple. If you think of God as energy, then you cannot think of God as some kind of heavenly father sitting up in the sky who loves you. Right? That just doesn't work for Emerson because his view is that if you think of God as a God of love who loves people, then you have to think of God as a God of hate who will send certain people to eternal damnation. And for Emerson, he just cannot buy Dante's Inferno at that level. So here he will say, if you are a believer in the second box, then you cannot have this notion of a personal deity. Yet, when the devout motions of the soul come, yield to them heart and life, though they should clothe God with shape and color. In other words, in loving yourself, you are loving deity because you are deity. Again, not that puny ego of the first, bo of the first box, but that soul, spirit, energy, consciousness that is the second box. He continues, leave your theory as Joseph is coat in the hand of the harlot and flee. Of course, a story from the Bible as Joseph was in temptation and a young uh, woman wanted to sleep with him and instead of sleeping with her, that is to say giving into the first box, he ran away even though it cost him a long time in a prison down in a dungeon. And then finally, passage 14, which many have, qual have qualified as the most quoted of all of the lines of self-reliance. A foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds adored by little statesmen, statesmen, statesmen and philosophers and divines. With consistency, a great soul has simply nothing to do. He may as well concern himself with his shadow on the wall. We're thinking here, of course, Plato's cave allegory, right? Out upon your guarded lips, sole them up with patch thread, dew, corpse in other words, else if you would be a man, speak what you think today in words as hard as cannonballs, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again, though it contradict everything you said today. Ah, then, exclaimed the aged ladies. He loves his insults. You shall be sure to be misunderstood. Misunderstood? Exclamation point. It is a right fool's word. Is it so bad then to be misunderstood? Pythagoras was misunderstood, and Socrates, and Jesus, and Luther, and Copernicus, and Galileo, and Newton. That's quite a list, isn't it? And every pure and wise spirit that ever took flesh to be great is to be misunderstood. Now, I've had many students who read this essay with me who are stunned that that's not the last line of the essay. They assume that was the last line of the essay because often in anthologies, if this essay has been in any way edited, this is usually the last line of the essay, to be great is to be misunderstood. Of course, we are here only at paragraph 14. We got 50 paragraphs total of this essay. So there's a whole lot of essay left, and I think it's important that we point that out. However, let's just point out here. This idea of consistency is one that we have to understand. Emerson is not saying that you should not have sustained will. Not at all. It's clear from all of his essays that he argues you need sustained will. But notice it is a foolish consistency, is the hobgoblin, right? In other words, just doing the same thing over and over without thinking about it. Go back to our lectures on Plato and the Apology of Socrates. The unexamined life is not worth living. Emerson will be arguing then don't just tell me what you do repeatedly, repetitively, but think about why you do those things and then we can begin to say that you are a true individual. Paragraph 15, he says it. Nature, he says, teaches us. No man can violate his nature. We're thinking here again of our Plato. And the way he says it is this way. In this pleasing, contrite wood life which God allows me, let me record day by day my honest thought without prospect or retrospect, and I cannot doubt it will be found symmetrical, though I mean it not and see it not. In other words, if you trust yourself as a writer, as an artist, you will find symmetry. My book shall smell of pines and resound with the hum of insects. We think of Thoreau here, don't we? The swallow over my window shall, intervene, shall interweave that thread or straw he carries in his bill into my web also. He loves nature and concrete symbols of nature. We pass for what we are. Character teaches above our wills. Men imagine that they communicate their virtue or vice only by overt actions and do not see that virtue or vice emit a breath every moment. This idea then that everything we need to know can be derived from our study of nature and our passion, our, our love of nature. 
Paragraph 16, he talks about the harmony of nature. This beautiful word picture about the zigzagging of a ship, it's quite a, it's quite a remarkable um, idea that he plays with. The voyage of the best ship is a zigzag line of a hundred tacks. I, I love that picture. In other words, if you had a bird's eye view on a ship, it doesn't sail straight. It moves back and forth, just like our life is. In other words, instead of worrying so much about always being dead on straight, Understand that your life moves and meanders, kind of like a river. So it's a, it's a nice word picture. He says that greatness always appeals as well to the future. And virtue, he says, is timeless. Paragraph 17. He says it this way. I hope in these days we have heard the last of conformity and consistency. Let the words be gazetted and ridiculous hence, henceforward. Instead of the gong for dinner, let us hear a whistle from the Spartan fife. He loves, of course, this reference to Sparta, as Plato did, because it's more direct. I went to the woods, uh, Thoreau will say in Bolden, I went to the woods because I wish to live deliberately. And then he talks about the essentials of life. And then he says it, I wanted to live, uh, live deep and suck out all the morrow of life to live Spartan-like. Let us bow and apologize nevermore. A great man is coming to eat at my house. I do not wish to please him. I wish that he should wish to please me. I will stand here for humanity, and though I would make it kind, I would make it true. And there really, in many ways, I think is the, is the issue. Let's not see Emerson as, as, as uh, rough and, uh, and, and a nasty person and doesn't believe in kindness. No, he very much believes in kindness, but he wants true kindness. I mean, think about it this way. If somebody compliments you and that somebody doesn't actually believe in the compliment, do you really want that compliment? If you're an athlete and the coach says to you, man, you, you played so great, you're an awesome, awesome talent, but the coach really doesn't believe that. Do you really want that compliment? And Emerson says, yeah, you probably do unless you have some spiritual enlightenment because that's the way we're hardwired. We want people to tell us how great we are even though we inside, deep down, know we're not that great. And so Emerson's call is true, be honest, and then you won't need other people's compliment, right? Think about that passage from the Bhagavad Gita book 2 that we've often quoted. You have the right to work, but for the work's sake only. You have no rights to the fruit of your labor. Desire for the fruits must never be your motive in working. Never give way to laziness either. In other words, if you do stuff simply because you're hoping somebody's going to say nice job, high five, this is a very problematic path to start down because you're going to live in your life often doing work and nobody's going to compliment you. In fact, doing your job well might actually make people jealous, right? And in that moment, you're going to have to deal with a whole different kind of project. Well, he says it in paragraph 17 as well. Every true man is a cause, a country, and an age. Requires infinite spaces and numbers and times fully to accomplish his thought. And prosperity seemed to follow his steps as a progression. And then he talks about what we call the worship of the great man theory. This idea is, the idea is that behind all great movements, there is a great person. And he gives, of course, a list. Luther is in the list. It doesn't shock us that Milton is in the list. And all he's saying here, and by the way, this is the conclusion of the first part here, is that if you look at history, great people have driven history, right? And to that degree, he will finish the first part. And now we move on to the second part, self-reliance and the individual himself. In the first 17 paragraphs, he's talked about why self-reliance is important. And now he's ready to go to work with it. Paragraph 18, he begins with a famous fable. It's a popular fable, he says, of the sot, that is to say the drunk, of the sot who was picked up dead drunk in the street, carried to the duke's house, washed and dressed and laid in the duke's bed, and on the waking, treated with all obsequious ceremony like the Duke and assured that he had been insane. It owes this fable, owes its popularity to the fact that it symbolizes so well the state of man who is in the world a sort of sot, but now and then wakes up, exercises his reason and finds himself a true prince. Now this is a very, very famous, of course, idea. The individual, for example, who wanders around all his life looking for an incredibly rich diamond and then finally dies after giving his whole life to looking for it and then feels his coat and there sewn inside is a diamond that would have made him a millionaire many times over. He had it all the time and didn't realize it. This is the argument that's being made here, paragraph 18. Paragraph 19 he says, 
our reading and our study turns us into, too often, worshipers instead of inspiring us to greatness ourselves. I think this is a this is really important reason why you should read this this essay because Emerson says you got to be careful when you go to school and, and you're asked to read because if you're not if you're not careful you will begin to assume that all of this reading is so that you can see that there are great people who have lived before you and that's all that you see Emerson is going to say there's nothing wrong with reading but allow your reading to inspire you to greatness you to try and be better right uh, paragraph 20 he says, all men should consider themselves kings or great men. In other words, again, just kind of following in the same line of thought. Paragraph 21, he talks about the aboriginal self. That's, a, that's an interesting term that leads to spontaneity, right, and instinct. It's the fountain of all action. Now, exactly what is he talking about? We're back to our two-box theory again. In other words, the fountainhead, to use Ayn Rand's title of her novel, the fountainhead of all great action is that second box, the recognition that you are not just a body, but you are also energy. You are a soul. You are a spirit. You are consciousness. You are energy, energy which cannot be created or destroyed. And if you are that, then you are something more than your body. And if you are that, then you can have perception or insight, as he talks about it in paragraph 21. He says, this perception is a fact like the sun, and we immediately think, of course, of Plato's Republic, book seven, the cave allegory, when the young, emancipated, educated, meaning educated, young man comes out of the cave, he sees the light of the sun, and the light of the sun is the true, it is the good. Paragraph 22, we continue. And he says it, it lives now. The power of the present is his argument here. And, uh, we'll, and we'll read now, he says, If, therefore, a man claims to know and speak of God and carries you backward to the phraseology of some old, moldered nation in another country, in another world, believe him not. Is the acorn